Pianist Lenny Tristano once said, Dizzy Gillespie is a nice trumpet player, but he's no Fats Navarro. He was overweight and talked in a high voice and was thus dubbed Fat Girl by his friends, the musicians who marveled at his technique. Gillespie had immaculate technique. Everything you wanted in a trumpet player. Navarro didn't have the same polish, no one ever has. But for flat-out playing, conveying some central chunk of the human experience, one cannot be faulted for taking Fats Navarro over Dizzy Gillespie any day. Jimmy Heath said during jam sessions between Fats Navarro and Miles Davis, Fats ate Miles up every night. Miles couldn't outswing him. He couldn't outpower him. He couldn't outsweet him. He couldn't do anything except take that whipping on every tune. Roy Haynes once said, Fats was a spectacular musician because, in a time when Cats arrived on the scene with nothing, he came on with everything. There are those kinds of guys who just play a lot of notes, some good, some bad. Fats wasn't one of those. He made his music be about each note, having a place and a reason. He could play those singing, melodic solos with a big, beautiful sound nobody could believe at the time. And he had so much warmth, so much feeling. That's why I said he had everything. Theodore Fats Navarro was born in Key West, Florida, September 24th, 1923, and was of Cuban, African, and Chinese descent. He was bilingual, speaking Spanish as his second language. Navarro's father, a barber by trade, had some musical knowledge and hired a piano teacher to give Navarro private lessons in his early childhood. Hence, the younger Navarro began to play piano at age six, although he did not become serious about music until he began playing trumpet at the age of 13. After graduating high school, he joined Saul Albright's band in Orlando, traveled with him to Cincinnati, took further trumpet lessons from an Ohio teacher, and soon went on the road with Snookum Russell's Indianapolis-based orchestra. Dizzy Gillespie, long acknowledged as the trumpet guru of the bop era, had been playing in the trumpet section of singer Billy Eckstein's band. But Gillespie was restless and needed to move on to the role of leader. Having heard Navarro, he recommended the younger trumpeter to Eckstein as his eventual replacement. As the leader told Leonard Feather for his new encyclopedia of jazz, a week or two after Navarro had joined us, you'd hardly know Dizzy had left the band. His ideas and feelings were the same, and there was just as much swing. Although Eckstein's group and other big bands yielded few opportunities for Navarro to demonstrate his improvisational skills, he used the opportunity to gain experience. Navarro remained with Eckstein's band for about 18 months. Life on the road didn't appeal to him, and soon he settled down in New York City, which became a veritable launching pad for his career. Navarro participated in small group recording sessions with Kenny Clark, Coleman Hawkins, and Howard McGee. Clark's 52nd Street Boys, also known as the Bebop Boys, recorded at the studio in September 1946 and 1947. The September sessions, in which Navarro participated, were among his first opportunities to play bebop in a studio session, and the group's work later formed part of the album Fats, Bud, Kluck, Sonny, Kinney. During this period, Fats also met Tad Dameron, a pianist better respected for his writing and arranging skills. Dameron and Navarro collaborated on a six-piece band from September 1947 to April 1949. Two recording sessions on Blue Note and one on Capitol during this period produced some of Navarro's best recorded work. Dameron, an innovative writer and arranger, fit in well with the emerging bebop style, utilizing its unique language in ways most writers could not master. Such originals as The Chase, our Delight and Dameronia became excellent vehicles for Navarro's solo work. Navarro eventually fell into a trap 
that caught so many of the jazz musicians of the 1940s. Following in the footsteps of Charlie Parker, the acknowledged leader of the bebop school, Navarro became addicted to heroin. Unfortunately, somewhere along the way, Navarro got involved with drugs. It's unknown when, where, or under what circumstances, but it would relentlessly plague him for the remainder of his short life. He followed the path of many other jazz musicians of the time in this regard, but unlike some, he was never able to overcome it. The trumpeter got caught up in the need to satisfy his addiction and began neglecting his health. He eventually developed a serious case of tuberculosis. Charles Mingus recalled an experience with Navarro after Fats joined the Lionel Hampton Band in 1948. The tour continued and Fats began to complain that he didn't feel good. He hurt all over and he wanted out. I thought it was just an excuse because they were all tired of the strenuous one-nighters. One day on the bus, Fats began coughing up blood. When they got to Chicago, he quit the band and left for New York. But Navarro's sickness did not diminish the fire in his playing. Despite all of his successes, jazz scholar Ross Russell suggests that Navarro remained a badly underrated musician during the course of his career due to his shy and subtle personality. Navarro's reserved personality translated into his impeccable playing abilities and disciplined practice habits. Gillespie has said that Navarro was the best all-around trumpeter of them all. Even though Gillespie was at the forefront of bebop trumpet playing, Navarro evolved the style in a way many would soon follow. Apart from his works with Tad Dameron, such as Symphonette and Our Delight, his most notable recordings included Ice Freezes Red and Fat Girl. The 1949 Bud Powell Quintet Session produced Dance of the Infidels and Bouncing with Bud and broadcast recordings with Charlie Parker, among which were Ornithology and The Street Beat. In addition to his drug problems, Navarro also contracted tuberculosis. The combination of his drug habit TB and a weight problem led to a sharp decline in his health and a curtailing of his musical activity during the last 17 months of his life. He nevertheless went on the road one last time for the Jazz at the Philharmonic Tour for about seven weeks in February and March of 1949. The date of his last recordings are a bit confusing. These were private records done live at Birdland that featured Charlie Parker and Bud Powell. Fats holds his own throughout, while playing several long and interesting solos. His exciting solo on The Street Beat is one of his longest on record. He was described as coughing uncontrollably and appearing physically emaciated during this period, which does not jive with the high quality of his play. In the long run, it doesn't matter. Theodore Fats Navarro died on July 6, 1950, at Metropolitan Hospital in New York. He was 26. The funeral took place in Harlem on July 13. Among the attendees was Charlie Parker. This is Alexander from One Track Jazz. Thanks for listening.